The uh, study that I've got today is one that I've done previously. I uh, did this earlier this year at the Shreveport study, and some of you, a handful of folks here, were there, so I apologize for the redundancy for those that will be hearing this the second time, but I hope that it's helpful, and I hope that it's interesting. Um, when I first started studying this topic, I really wasn't sure uh, how to go through it, and I wasn't sure where I would end up. I think like a lot of people that I've spoken with uh, after coming up with this study, when I started, I thought I had an answer. There was a, an opinion I held about this question, about are there degrees of punishment and are there degrees of reward. And uh, going through the study, I feel I've had to think about a lot of things that I just took for granted. And so I hope that the study that we have today will be helpful to all of us in some way. I'll say right at the outset here, and I hope this isn't too disappointing to anybody, my goal in this study really isn't going to be to persuade you one way or the other as to whether there are or whether there are not degrees of punishment and or reward, but to really get us thinking and focusing on what eternity is and the implications that the scriptures teach us about the punishment that awaits for the wicked and about the reward that awaits for the saved. But this is a natural, natural question. We find in no uncertain terms in the Bible that we will live forever. Every person in this building is going to continue to exist throughout all of eternity. And we will do so in one of two places. If we are wicked and deemed wicked at the judgment, then we will spend eternity in the devil's hell. But if we are righteous, if we are among the saved, then we will be rewarded with eternal life in heaven. Amongst that, I mean, that is not, there's not much debate about that, especially amongst us. But I think our human minds are naturally curious. And when we begin to think about things, especially things that in many ways are unknown, things that are future, we wonder and we're curious and we want to know more details about what is to come. What exactly will heaven be like? We have lots of questions about the details of heaven. We have questions about the details of hell. And that's understandable, why we would want to know and think about these things. But I do want to warn that in some of these situations, we get into a place that is highly ruled by speculation. A lot of what you'll find people saying and believing about eternity really is nothing more than speculation and even human reasoning. And that's one thing that we have to be very careful about and why we have to focus simply on what the Scriptures say and also place our trust in God. Trust in God that whatever eternity holds, it is right and it is good. And whether we have it all figured out now or not is not really the most important of things. But making sure that we're ready and we're prepared is what is most important. But as we start a study of this specific question, which is one of the questions that comes up when we think about eternity, will there be degrees of reward? Will some people enjoy heaven a little bit more than others? Will some people suffer more in hell than others? That is a natural question. But a few points that we need to make at the very onset of this, and I just mentioned this, but we have to remember God is completely good. And God is completely just. And thus we place our trust in Him. One of the problems with this topic is we often look at it from a very human perspective. And we look at it and we make sense based on what makes sense to us, especially in our cultural climate. Now I hear people say, well, it would only be fair for God to do this. Or I hear people say, well, it would be unfair for God to do this. Well, what is fair and unfair for God to do in terms of our punishment and our reward is not up for us to say. That's not our prerogative to determine, well, if I work harder, it's only fair that God gives me a bigger reward. That's not our prerogative to say. It's also not our prerogative to say, well, God has to give us all the same reward. That's not our decision to make. Whatever decision God has made and will make is the right decision. And we need to place our trust that whatever eternity holds, it is what is right for us. You know, one example I saw... And a lot of people have opinions like this. Wayne Jackson, many of you have probably read Wayne Jackson with the Christian career. I like a lot of Wayne Jackson stuff. I enjoyed his article on this topic, but he made the comment early on uh, that we can see from the Bible and from common sense that there are degrees of reward. Well, that sounds good, but the problem is that's reasoning from human common sense. We're making God a being that is, whose ways are far above our ways condescend to our common sense approach 
to how work and reward should operate. So we need to be careful about those things. But the other thing, and I think this is very important, this is what I really came back to again and again as I studied through the various passages that pertain to this question, is however we answer this question, we need to be very careful about what it does to our motivations and how ideas of greater reward or worse or more tolerable punishment might affect the way that that motivates us in our service to Christ. One of the things that I found a little alarming as I started to study this topic was how heavily Calvinists support degrees of reward. Now, just because a Calvinist believes something doesn't automatically make it wrong. But when I saw how heavily Calvinism is tied into the idea of degrees of reward, it, it did cause me a little bit of alarm. And what is interesting about that is people that will say, you know, works are nothing. Works have nothing to do with salvation. Works have nothing, you know, works are, are nothing in our life. But they separate salvation and reward. Salvation and reward in their minds are two completely different things. Salvation is by faith only. And once you're saved, there's nothing that can happen to take away your salvation. But your reward is a different thing entirely. In fact, I, one of the men I go to church with uh, there at Springer Road, he works with a, a Baptist individual, and he said on many occasions, as they've talked about it, that idea of faith and works, the man has told him, my, I'm saved, and my salvation, my home in heaven is secure. Now I'm just working for a bigger mansion. And that's literally how he looks at it. He looks at his works as getting him a bigger reward. And so what you have is people that completely deny works being motivated primarily, if not solely, by works for the degree of their reward. And I'll submit to you that's a dangerous mindset. To serve Christ simply out of a desire for a bigger, fancier reward is a dangerous reason to serve Christ. If our service is not based out of love and faith in Him, but simply for what we get out of it in eternity, and only what we get out of it in eternity, that's a dangerous reward. You know, there's other uh, motivations that can take place. Some people might look at that and say, well, you know what? If, uh, if there's degrees, why would I work hard? You know, if, after all, the, the best place or the worst place in heaven, the, the, the smallest reward in heaven... That's going to be better than even the best place in hell, right? And that, that would be true. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So why work hard? Why do more than brother so-and-so? Why be more faithful than sister so-and-so? Why be the best that I can be if heaven, even at the worst, is better than hell at its best? And so we get an attitude of laziness. You know, even in terms of equal rewards, even if you view equality of rewards and no varying of degrees, that can lead to improper motivations. Because if we're all going to share the same reward, why work harder, right? In fact, we're going to talk about the, the parable of, of the laborers in the vineyard. And that caused them some anger that people that hadn't worked as hard as they had were being paid the same amount that they were getting paid. And so why should I do more than any other brother or sister if we're all just going to get the same reward? See, one of the problems that arises or can arise in this discussion is our motivations. So that's what we'll come back to over and again is having the right motivation as we seek to serve the Lord. But as we get into the actual discussion, you know, there are several passages that are used to argue one way or the other. Passages that seem to indicate a variety of punishment or varying degrees in reward. And there's some passages that folks use to try and argue for equality of rewards or punishment. But one of the, the primary passages, and we're not going to get to look at all of them today. We can ask some questions or discuss a few others perhaps in the question and answer session. But I'm going to focus on a few in particular, especially the parables. Because several of Jesus' parables are uh, what folks go to, what we go to, to in this discussion of a variety of degrees. And one of those is the parable of the unfaithful servant in Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. At the end of that passage, in verses 47, we find the Lord saying something along the lines of certain servants being beaten with many stripes and other servants beaten with few stripes. But to understand this parable, and really to understand any parable, we have to understand the context. And we have to understand what the theme and the purpose of the parable was. It is a great mistake to look at a parable and to pick one piece out and make decisions based upon what one piece sounds like without considering what was Jesus teaching in this parable 
And why was he teaching the parable in the first place? And so as we look at the context of the parable, what led up to the parable, we find some interesting things. First of all, as Jesus was preaching, if you back all the way up to verse 13, Jesus is preaching, and we find an individual that asks a very odd question. An individual kind of speaks up, and he asks Jesus to command his brother to divide the inheritance with him. Or can you imagine listening to Jesus preach some sermon, and then someone stands up, completely off base, completely off what Jesus is talking about, and they say, you're an authoritative teacher. I want you to command my brother to divide my inheritance with me. Now, what's the problem with that situation? This man is not gaining spiritual knowledge from the Master. This man's focused on earthly things. This man's focused on physical things. And what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus answers the man by launching into several teachings and parables. First of all, we find next in Luke's account the parable of the rich fool in Luke 16 through tw uh, verses 16 through 21. We know that parable, the why or the rich man who tore down his barns to build greater, and he told himself to eat, drink, and be merry. He had many goods laid up for many years, and he what, what's the lesson? This man is trusting in his riches. He's trusting in what he has here and physical things. And Jesus says that God said of him, Thou fool, this night will your soul be required of you. What we see is this man trusted in riches and he was unprepared for eternity. Jesus then taught his followers to be rich spiritually instead of trusting in physical things. Instead of worrying about the physical things. There's a parallel here in what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's teaching them to put their trust in God and to put him above all other things. As he says in, in verse 34, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Unlike the rich fool who placed his treasure in physical things that could pass away and be taken away at any moment, he says, you lay up heavenly treasures. He's working on their motivations. He's working on what they're focused on. But he's also working on their preparation. People that trust in the world's riches are unprepared. And so from there, he launches into another parable. He talks about the parable of the prepared servants. Um, now, he mentions this. He talks about having waists girded and lamps lit in this specific parable. And the picture that we have is of servants that were waiting for the master to return from his wedding. Now, they don't know exactly when the master will return, but... If they are prepared, if they're waiting, if they're ready to welcome the Master when He does return, something interesting happens. Jesus says that He will greatly reward them. In fact, it says that He will serve them. Now there's where this parable kind of departs a little bit from what typically happens. If a Master comes home and His servants are ready to serve Him, then they serve Him. But Jesus says, if you're prepared then you will actually be greatly rewarded. Have you ever heard of a master going in and saying, well, my servants are doing a good job. I should now serve them. I should repay them greatly. What you see is these servants are getting, for doing what they ought to do, they're getting much more than they actually deserved. They are being rewarded by the master if they are prepared. But then he turns in verses 39 through 40 to using a different analogy, and he uses that of a thief. And he, he uses this example of a thief to get his point across about being prepared. To remind and drive home the point, we don't know when that time is coming. Now if a thief called and asked permission to come at 10 o'clock on a night, or asked if you were going to be there on a certain night, you wouldn't be robbed, you'd be prepared. There's no chance of being caught unprepared. But that's not how thieves operate. And so he, he uses this idea of a thief, but it's at this point when Jesus talks about a thief, that then something important happens. Peter speaks up. And Peter asks, asks a question in verse 41. He's probably speaking on behalf of all the disciples. I would imagine many of them were thinking this, and maybe even the whole crowd that Jesus was speaking to. He says, Lord, do you speak this parable to us or to all people? Now, why is the audience of who Jesus is talking about this important? Why does Peter bring this question up, and why does it lead to the parable that we're about to look at that Jesus would then give? Well, remember the twelve, Peter and the other disciples, they are still learning a great deal about the nature of the kingdom. They're still learning their roles in it. In fact, even up until fairly late in Jesus' ministry, they would be arguing over things like who would be the greatest in the kingdom? Who would have the most authority in the kingdom? And Jesus was constantly 
teaching them the truth about the kingdom. We'll see that here in just a little while. And so when Jesus was speaking these parables, and He speaks about heavenly treasure, and He even refers to potential loss by referring to a thief, Peter is a little perplexed. Is Jesus speaking this to him, to the apostles, to the disciples? Is He indicating that even the disciples could be caught off guard and could lose out on what they thought was sure? Or is Jesus teaching something generic, more for all people, something for the rest? Well, Jesus does what He typically does. He doesn't answer Peter directly. Instead, He launches in to another parable. And that's what we find in Luke chapter 12. Verses, picking up in verse 42, it says, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For every one to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Now remember, why did Jesus speak this parable? For a few reasons, and we'll get to the themes, but Jesus spoke this parable as a response to Peter's question. And what he does is, once again, he uses the master-servant imagery. But this time, the master gives a servant certain responsibility. He places one servant as a steward to distribute the food to the other servants. He's taking care of the other servants. Now, he's still a servant. He has some authority. He's been given some authority by the master, but he's still a servant himself. But he is to look out for the other servants, to take care of the other servants. He's responsible for feeding the rest. But as with the previous illustration, the return of the master is actually unknown. The, ma the, the steward doesn't know that the, serv the master's coming back in a week, or if it's a month, or if it's ten years. He's just given this responsibility until the master returns. Well, Jesus talks about reward. He says that when the master returns, that if the steward is found faithfully performing his duties, if he's doing what he was commanded and told to do, that again we find a great reward. In fact, Jesus says that if the master returns and finds him so doing, he will make him master over all that he has. Now that doesn't line up. Now that's the attitude of some people in an expectation way. Now some people think that they need to be given more simply because they do what they are told to do. Simply because they do the bare minimum of what is expected of them, they think they deserve heaps of praise and gratitude. And we know that's not the way that things work. When we do our job, we might expect a reward or expect what we are agreed upon, but we're not greatly and highly favored for simply doing our job. And yet Jesus says of these servants, if he does what the master told him to do, when the master returns, he will actually make him master over all that he has. Does the servant deserve that? For simply doing what a servant does? No. Jesus is teaching something here about the reward. And that is it's something far beyond what we deserve. Even however righteous we live our lives, the reward that we are going to enjoy far exceeds what we really deserve. And also, just a side note here, it's interesting that Jesus kind of uses different analogies and He makes different points across different parables. Now in another parable that we'll look at very briefly, Jesus talks about men being set over certain cities. You know, a man being set over ten cities. Or a man being set over five cities. And sometimes we draw conclusions from that. But here in this analogy, the master doesn't set the servant over five or ten cities. He sets him over all that he has. And so I think we need to be careful about putting specific application on certain parables when Jesus actually kind of varies the way that He teaches in these parables. It might be that He's simply teaching about the, the greatness and the awesomeness of the reward or the punishment. But now He gets to the, the servant that is not prepared. He describes a servant who thinks that his master will tarry in returning. 
And thus, he begins to act foolishly. Not just foolishly, but w wickedly. Feeling his master won't be back for some time, he not only shirks his duties, but he abuses his position. Instead of caring for the other servants, remember he's supposed to feed the servants, he actually abuses them. And he takes what is supposed to be given to them, and he takes it for himself. He begins to abuse his authority. And then the wicked servant is surprised when the master returns. The wicked servant has no time to make it even look like he obeyed the master. He doesn't have time to cover up his disobedience and his abuse. And his unfaithfulness is clear. The gross negligence of his duties, his abuse of the other servants, and his outright rebellion against the master's command. What do they get him? They get him a severe and a terrible punishment. We're told that he will be cut in two. Now contextually, I think this is a hyperbole referring to punishment that is terribly severe. That was a method of execution. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here because we see the man still alive in the, in the next verse being beaten with many stripes. And so this is a phrase meaning severe punishment. And what is interesting is it says that he will share the lot of the unbeliever. This is one of the keys of this parable. Jesus is not speaking about people that are unbelievers here. He's speaking about someone that was a believer. He was a servant of the Master. In fact, he was such a, a, a servant of the Master that he had been given responsibility and authority. And yet, if he acts wickedly, he will share the lot of even the unbelievers. Does that mean that even a believer can lose their reward? Yes, it does. That means that salvation is not a guaranteed thing just because one begins to follow Christ and serve Christ. If they begin to act like unbelievers, they will share the lot of the unbelievers. But to the believer, especially the leader, they need to take heed because they will lose their reward and be punished. Now the punishment is expounded upon there in verses 47 and 48. Jesus explains that the servant who knew the master's will but did not do it will be beaten with many stripes. There are other servants, however, that for some reason did not know the Master's will. Jesus doesn't expound on, on this to explain why these servants did not know the Master's will, but they did not, and thus they behaved in a way that earned punishment, and they too were beaten, but he says, with fewer stripes. Now the conclusion that is drawn, and reasonably so, is when Jesus says there will be some who are beaten with many stripes and some with fewer stripes, that Jesus is saying that there are those that will suffer a worse punishment than others. But as we come to that conclusion, the question we need to ask is, what is the purpose of this parable? What is the primary teaching that Jesus is trying to illustrate? If we draw conclusions that are not the focus of what Jesus is teaching, we run a very real risk of missing the real teaching, as well as the risk of forcing conclusions that weren't actually meant in the first place. And so we ask the question, is the purpose of this parable to teach about degrees of reward and punishment? And I don't think it is. Now for some commentators I've read, you would think that that was the only point Jesus was teaching, was degrees of punishment in this parable. But that's not the main thrust of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is emphasizing, first of all, the importance of being prepared. That's the context of the whole passage, is preparation. We don't know when the Master is returning, so we serve Him always. We serve Him faithfully as we ought to. But Jesus is further emphasizing that yes, even believers can lose their reward if they rebel against the Lord's commands thinking they have plenty of time before His returns. In other words, they also are unprepared. Now remember, this parable is an answer to Peter's question. Yes, Jesus' teachings were directed at all of them. But it was also directed towards Peter and the others. Believers need to realize they can lose their reward. When we think we have it made, when we think that we can act slothfully and wickedly because we are assured of something, then what we actually will face in the end is punishment. Thus you could argue that really one of Jesus' main points is that we shouldn't serve for a reward, but should always fulfill our duty faithfully whether we think the Master's return is imminent or still far off. And further, Jesus is stressing that with greater opportunity, or with greater privilege, there is greater responsibility. This is clear from Jesus' clarifying statement in verse 48. For to everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, 
of him, they will ask more. I think David Roper's comments in his Life of Christ commentary are good on this point. He says, Jesus' purpose in speaking those words was not to announce a new teaching concerning degrees of punishment in hell. If the words are pressed beyond what is intended, we may reach the conclusion that there is value in ignorance, which is untrue. Rather, Christ was stressing that privilege brings responsibility. The greater the privilege, the greater the responsibility. The primary focus of this passage has to do with being prepared for the Master's return and faithfully serving Him until that time whenever it might be. Those that have greater opportunity to know the Master's will will face a greater responsibility and thus a greater expectation from the Lord to be prepared. Now, could these verses still be pointing in a secondary nature to, the, to degrees of punishment? Possibly. But, since that is not the primary focus of the parable, we must use caution. Like Mr. Roper said, and I think this is very important, if we press this point too far, and I've heard people argue this way, we will find value in ignorance. For people say, well, should we really go there? Because after all, if they hear the gospel and they don't obey it, now they're in for a worse punishment. We've done them no favors. That should never be the method of which we determine whether or not to go and preach the gospel. We cannot place value on ignorance, which again, if pressed too far, is exactly what this mindset will lead to. So we must be cautious. But there are some other passages uh, that lead us to think sometimes that there will be worse punishment for some. And one of those is what Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 20 through 24, where He talks about it being more tolerable for certain places. I'm not going to read all of this, but as He's giving some rebuke to, to some modern uh, societies and, that Jesus was among, He said, It will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. He's talking to Chorazan and Bethsaida. He's saying, Tyre and Sidon, who have been judged long ago, it will be more tolerable for them on judgment than it will be for you. He also says later on, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, we might come to the conclusion that when Jesus says it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, that He's saying the punishment of Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah will not be as bad as the punishment of Chorazan or Bethsaida. Now, more tolerable, we think of that as we can bear that more. And so, is Jesus saying that the people of these societies will actually have it better off in eternity than the citizens of Bethsaida and Chorazan and these other cities that rejected Jesus? Well, a question that we have to ask here is when Jesus says it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment, is He speaking of the standard of judgment or is He speaking of the result of the punishment? See, Jesus is teaching... I think primarily that those that have more opportunity will be judged with greater strictness. And what Jesus is not talking about the moral sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and Tyre and Sidon. If you were to compare the moral sins of Sodom and Gomorrah with the morality of Bethsaida and Chorazan, well, in our mind, Sodom loses. Sodom and Gomorrah was a much more wicked, evil city. But... Sodom and Gomorrah rejected the preaching of righteous Lot. Bethsaida and Chorazan and the other cities, who did they reject? They rejected the teaching and the miracles and the signs of the Son of God Himself. They had one much greater than Lot or even Abraham or anybody else at that time. And they still rejected. And thus Jesus says, it will be worse in the judgment for you than for them. You had greater opportunity. You have much less excuse to deny the truth than they ever did. But, as we're going to see in a minute, their punishment is not tolerable. And that's where I want to lead into some important truths as we talk about uh, degrees of punishment. Let's assume, for right now, that the Lord's language of more stripes and more tolerable refer to degrees of punishment. Let's assume that it does for just a moment. Even if that's the case, there's some important truths to understand. First and foremost, regardless of the degree of punishment, even tolerable punishment is severe punishment. Look at what is said in, of Sodom and Gomorrah in Jude 7. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now I ask you, how, how tolerable is the vengeance of eternal fire? If that's the more tolerable of the punishment, all that does is accentuate how terrible other punishment must be. This is not something that we can say, well, you know, I'm okay with the more tolerable judgment 
I'm okay with denying Christ because I think that, you know, I'm not as bad as other people are. I'm not going to get the worst punishment. It's still beyond our comprehension what awaits for those, even if they receive the most tolerable punishment. But even more importantly, why are some deemed worthy of worse punishment or stricter judgment? Now, we often classify sins. And people have this very, real, this very real mindset amongst themselves that hell will be hotter for those that are rapists, murderers, people that do the worst things, you know, the Adolf Hitlers of the world that commit genocide. Those people deserve to suffer more than anybody else in hell. That makes sense to us, but that is never taught in the Bible. The Bible never teaches, from what I can tell, that people will suffer more because they were more wicked than the others. What we see is always the stricter judgment is for those who had more opportunity. Every one of these cases that you can look at, it's because they had more opportunity. They spurned greater opportunity. Now, why is that important? That's important because I wholeheartedly believe that all of us here today have already opted out of the opportunity of a more tolerable judgment. We've heard the truth. Most of us here have believed and obeyed the truth. We have had opportunity after opportunity. We live in a time where we have greater access to the Word of God than at any point in history. We enjoy freedoms that have been unknown to much of history. We have had incredible opportunity to know the truth. If you and I are lost, and there are degrees of punishment... I believe wholeheartedly we will not be those receiving the more tolerable judgment because we have had great opportunity. There's other verses that seem to indicate this uh, that, that you could look at. But that's an important warning. If there are degrees, we're in line for the worst. But another question as we talk about degrees of punishment, how would it work? Well, would it be more pain? Would the fires be hotter and the darkness be dark, darker? Adam Clark in his commentary takes this view that there literally will be worse pain for some than others. Some think that it might be regret if there were degrees. You know, it would be worse, we can imagine. You know, imagine you sat through a lifetime of invitation songs and you end up in hell. Having never obeyed the gospel no matter how many times you heard it. Imagine the pain that would be there of not only the torment of hell but the knowledge for eternity that you had the opportunity. So some think maybe that's how it will be worse for those that have greater opportunity. That makes sense. That, that's logical. But the truth is we, really, we just really aren't told. If there are degrees, when Jesus says that He will be beaten with more stripes and others with few, He doesn't explain how more stripes uh, correlates over into our actual eternal punishment. So again, it gets into a realm of speculation. But a few passages. Here's a few passages and if anyone wants to look at these in the question and answer session, perhaps we could. But these are a few passages that are sometimes used for uh, arguing of degrees of punishment uh, for, for your use. But let's go on very quickly to are there degrees of reward. Some people, and I'll admit when I first started this study, I approached it, I thought, you know, there are degrees of punishment. I viewed what Jesus said in Luke 12 as degrees of punishment. Now, I'm not quite as sure about that, but I thought, you know, degrees of reward, I, I'm not positive. Um, but some people are very adamant that there are degrees of reward. Again, Calvinists are very uh, positive that there are degrees of reward. There's a phrase that is sometimes used to argue this point. Over and over in the Bible, you find about, uh, a phrase about judgment regarding each one according to his deeds. Here's a list of just a few of them. We're not going to read all of them, but just a couple to see how they work. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Jesus, Matthew 16, verse 27. The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. The argument is that this idea of according to his works or indicates degrees. You know, if you have worked uh, very righteously and very faithfully and very hard or you've suffered much, then according to your works you will be rewarded. If you've not worked quite as hard or you haven't suffered as much but you've still been faithful, you'll be rewarded according to your works. Likewise, on the punishment side, if you're really evil, you'd be uh, rewarded with greater punishment. But it, we need to take a look at this and see, is that really what this means. When, G when the Lord or the Bible talks about rendering each one according to his works, is that an individualized scale that then impacts reward? Consider this verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Paul said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, 
whether good or bad. It's the same idea. He says we will each be uh, uh, judged according to what we've done. But then he boils it down to one of two options. Either good or bad. You'll be judged as to whether you were obedient and faithful and thus your works are deemed as good. Or you will be judged as unfaithful and disobedient and thus bad. Not necessarily a degree of how good and how bad, but simply, were you faithful or were you unfaithful? And I think that we can interpret every one of these passages where we see according to his deeds, you can boil it down to, was he faithful or unfaithful? Jesus, I think, uh, also looks at this in John 5, 28, verse 29. It says, For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. No, no mention of how good or how evil, but the good will reward, be rewarded for following Christ. The evil will resurrect, but to condemnation. But there's also a parable that some look to, uh, to, to try and talk about this, more so from a point of equality of reward. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1-16. through 16. We don't have the time to go through it all uh, at this moment. But in that passage, Jesus talks, uh, he gives a parable about some workers. What he does is he mentions a, a master who goes, or a landowner, and he goes very early in the morning and he hires some men to go work in his vineyard. Now they negotiate a price and he agrees to pay them a denarius for their, their day's labor. So they go out and they would have begun about 6 a.m. The Jewish work day would have been from about 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. In the way we look at time. A 12-hour day. They would have worked a long time. They would have worked very hard. They would have worked through the heat of the day. But this landowner goes out again at the third hour, around 9 o'clock. And he finds some other men and he hires them to go work in his vineyard. But something different happens here. These people don't agree on a price. He just says, you go work and at the end of the day I'll pay you what is right. And they go. Can you imagine going to a job, someone hiring you and saying, I want you to do this and I want you to work for so long and then at the end I'll decide what to pay you. It would take a great deal of faith and trust in that person to be honest and good in the way that they deal to go work without any idea of how much you were going to get paid. What if they gypped you? What if they didn't pay you at all? They went and they worked on a principle of faith and trust, not on an, agreed, uh, on an agreement like the first people. Well, the, the master does it again at 12 and at 3, even at 5 o'clock in the afternoon with one hour left. The heat of the day is already subsiding. There's not much time left. He goes and he hires people to work one hour. Now, when he get, begins to pay, the day is over and the workers come. He does something strange. He pays the people that were hired last first. The guys that only worked one hour, they get to get their payment first. The guys that have been working for 12 hours have to wait till the end of the line. But also, when these people are watching and no one knows what they're going to get paid, you might think a fraction of a denarius. And yet the master gives them a denarius. He gives them the same thing. And then he does the same thing for the, the guys that came at three. And those that came at noon. And by this point, those that were hired at the beginning of the day, they're watching and they see what's getting paid. And they begin to reason among themselves and say, we're going to get more than this. Notice the master never said they would get more. They reasoned it themselves. This wasn't part of, this was human reasoning. And then they get up to the line expecting something greater and they get what they agreed to. Daenerys, and they're furious. They're mad. They say, we've borne the heat of the day. We've worked longer. They haven't done half of what we've done. And they get paid what we get paid. Would we be any less indignant in our own lives? You know, there's a great lesson here. The master says, did I not pay you what we agreed upon? This is what you asked for. This is what you agreed upon. By the way, there could be a, a reminder here that serving the Lord with expectation is not the way to serve the Lord. We don't want to be rewarded with what we've asked for or what we deserve. These men got what they deserved. We don't want what we deserve. The others worked in faith and they worked what they could and they were rewarded. But Jesus teaches these people had a wrong attitude. But what does this parable get to? What's the context of this parable? Again, this context is important. And back in verses 13 through 15, and I think this is where the beginning context really is, you find some children being brought to Jesus. And the disciples rebuked them and wouldn't let them come to Jesus. And Jesus rebuked the disciples. They had this attitude that these children were not important enough to come to the Master. And they're rebuked for that. Following that, we have the story of the rich young ruler. 
This man comes and he's, he's done so much for the Lord, but he's not willing to give up his great possessions. And he goes away sorrowful. After that, it leads to a discussion on the difficulty for the rich in, in verses 23 through 26. And then notice again, Peter precipitates the parable. Peter asks a question again. Having seen this discussion take place, he says to Jesus, We have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? Kind of an interesting question, isn't it? You see a little bit of expectation in Peter's voice. This man may not have been willing to give up what he had to follow you, but we have done that. What can we expect? And Jesus responds to that in verses 28 through 30 with the principle that the first will be last and the last will be first. And then he launches into this parable that we just described and ends with that same idea. The last will be first and the first will be last. So what's the purpose of that parable as a response to Peter? I think we see that Jesus is teaching a great deal about proper attitudes. Remember, the disciples had an improper attitude about worth in the kingdom. These children don't deserve to come to Jesus. But the kingdom is not made up of rich and powerful and mighty people. The kingdom is made up of people that are poor in spirit and people that have become like children. And when we have attitudes that we are greater than one another, or we are more spiritual than one another, we're showing that we really don't have the kingdom attitude at all. Jesus was rebuking their attitude. That's the attitude of the laborers. They are saying we are worth more in the vineyard because we've worked harder, we've worked longer, we deserve more. Jesus is saying, no, that's not the case. They had improper attitudes about worth in the kingdom. He's teaching about faith. The workers that worked without the promise of reward, but they, just that the Lord would do what was right, and the thankfulness for the reward. Can you imagine how thankful those men must have been that worked for an hour and they got the same thing as everybody else? How thankful they must have been for that reward. But the men that got what they asked for showed an attitude of ingratitude. Now, does this teach equality of reward? Perhaps. But actually, I think that it teaches more importantly, don't worry about the, the degree of your reward. Don't begin thinking that you deserve more. Don't compare yourself to others and say, well, I go to church more, I read my Bible more, I teach more, I do more, I'm more righteous. I deserve a better reward in heaven. That's not the way we approach serving the Master. We need to have the right attitude of worth in the kingdom. Now, there's a couple other parables, and we don't have time. We're quickly winding down on our time. But the parables of the talents and the minas, and we're only going to spend a couple of minutes here. We can ask about these in the question and answer a little bit more. Uh, but you have these parables, and there's a few differences. There's a lot of similarities, but some differences. In the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, various talents were given. One got five, one got two. But the servants were equally profitable. The one that had five talents given, he produced five more. The one who had two talents given produced two more. Now he didn't produce as much as the other man, but he, were, he was as productive. Both of them doubled their productivity. The man who did nothing, he was punished. And the servants received, in this case, the same reward. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So it could be argued that these men received different rewards, but they both received proportionally to what they had done. But, here's the other point. Jesus said, you were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Does being good in a few things warrant being greatly rewarded by many things? Not really. The, the, the reward far outweighs what is deserved. Now, in the parable of the minas, we have ten servants, each of which get the same. Each one gets one mina. Now, there's various productivity. They, some earn more than others with their one mina and they are rewarded proportionally. One man who earns ten minas gets ten cities. man who earns five gets five cities. So there's a degree of reward that it looks like. But here's something interesting. This is one of the few parables that the purpose is explicitly stated. And the purpose is not to talk about reward and degrees thereof. In verse 19 of Luke 9, or verse 11, it says that Jesus taught this because they thought, the disciples thought, that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. The, the parable of the minas is correcting misconceptions about the kingdom and the nature of the kingdom. It's not purposed around teaching purpose, uh, degrees of reward, but the kingdom. So we need to be careful there. But another passage I want to look at before we close, 2 Peter 1 verse 1 
Peter says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. And what does this have to do with the idea of degrees of reward? Well, look at what Peter says of these people that he was writing to. He says, to those who have obtained a faith equal with ours. I don't know about you, but I have never once in my life considered my faith to be on equal standing with the Apostle Peter. And I'm sure the people that he wrote to didn't either. And yet what an incredible encouragement to read after someone like Peter who says to those that are following Christ faithfully, your faith is on an equal standing with ours. What an incredible promise that is. Now the question is, if our faith is equal because we are following the same Master, will our reward be different? Now, don't get me wrong, I am not arguing that I think I deserve the same reward as Peter. I don't. In my, in my mind, I don't deserve anything close to what Peter will get or what Paul will get. But at the end of the day, Peter and Paul don't deserve a gift either. As great and as righteous as they were, they're saved by grace the way we are. They're saved by the blood of Christ just the way we are. Now, how would this work? There's a few ideas, bigger mansion, do some people enjoy it more, do some people get more responsibility like in the cities, or would it just simply be an inherent appreciation? I heard, I think it was Alan Bonifay told me about Linwood Smith at a study one time talking about this topic. After much debate had gone on, finally stood up and simply said, I believe Paul's penny will mean more to him than it will to me. If there are degrees, that makes the most sense to me that it will be based upon our inherent appreciation. You know, some people think, well, if someone suffers more, someone suffers a martyr's death, they'll appreciate heaven more than someone that just suffered ridicule. Maybe so, but the truth is, all will enjoy heaven. Here's a few other passages that we can look at here in just a moment. But in conclusion, are there degrees of reward and punishment? And I'll admit to you right now, I don't know. That's the one thing I'm certain of as I've studied this. I can't come to a solid conclusion as to whether there are or whether there aren't. But I have felt more and more secure that that's the right answer. It's intentionally ambiguous in some ways. That we aren't given specifically, you know, we have a parable where they are rewarded separately. We have a parable where they're rewarded equally. See, the focus should not be on how great will the reward be. The focus should be on serving the Lord and understanding and trusting the promise that all will receive the crown. Paul said, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved His appearing. That's a promise to all. Now, whether we get a bigger reward is hardly the most relevant thing for us to think about. But to know that all will receive a reward. And also, if there are degrees, we can rest assured that the difference between the smallest reward in heaven and the most tolerable punishment in hell is an infinite chasm. We don't want to understand what the degrees of punishment might mean. And I want to promise you this, if there are degrees of reward, the smallest treasure in heaven that you might enjoy is so far beyond our imagination of how wonderful and blissful it will be that it will be a wonderful promise. So, don't let a desire for greater reward, this is the main point, don't let a, a desire for greater reward be your primary motivation. That's a very dangerous mindset. Let a love of Christ motivate you. Bring others to Christ not so that you can get a bigger mansion or more jewels in your crown, but so that you can bring others to Christ and save their souls and bring glory to God. Don't seek to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Seek to be the greatest servant. Work as hard and as faithfully as you possibly can in the Lord's kingdom. Thank Him for His grace and simply place your trust in Him to provide you the eternal reward that He has promised.